Welcome to The Difference. Today, I get to share a story with you that has been 65 years in the making. My guest, Pastor John Hagee. You don't want to miss this episode of The Difference. Today on The Difference, I am delighted to have the opportunity to visit with my parents and discuss a monumentous occasion Pastor Hagee's 65th anniversary in full-time gospel ministry. Dad, first and foremost, before we even begin the conversation about how you got here, which, you know, 65 years, it's a long story, so we're going to take several several shows to discuss it. Uh, I want to say how honored I am to be able to have this conversation because even the fact that we're able to celebrate this moment means that you have faithfully courageously and consistently served the Lord and your purpose in continuing to take all the gospel to all the world and to every generation. Many people uh, see what you've done and they say, well, you know, it, it happened suddenly or, or you know, <laughs> somebody showed up someday and, and, and flipped a switch and, and all this came to be. Uh, but it started in very humble beginnings <laughs> and just through a tremendous amount of effort and God's blessings is where it is today. Uh, I've heard the story a multitude of times, but every time you share the story, I get to hear from people who say, I never knew that. Take us from April the 12th, 1940 <laughs> to January of 1958. That's 18 years, but you, you, you're brief. Tell us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was born April 12th, 1940 in a place called Goose Creek, Texas. That's now known as Baytown. Uh, my mother and father were the pastors of the First Assembly of God Church in Channel View from 1935 to 1952. My father, for whatever reason, was not enthusiastic about my participating in sports he never went to a game. He never talked about it. He didn't allow it to be discussed in the house. And there was a breach between the two of us that was enormous and that stayed for many years because of that. Uh, the fact that I came to Christ was simply to the fact that uh, my mother began a prayer group with a group of people, a select secretive prayer group and they met at the church to pray for one thing my mother said if john leaves this church without knowing jesus mm -hmm. christ he will never come to christ she was right and she was right because i had a belly burn against all of that <laughs> pentecostal legalism that was deep and it was pure i when when i walked out of the church i said take a picture because it's the last time you're ever going to see me here and we were having, in January of 1953, one of those eternal <laughs> revivals that we had. We had three or four a year. They lasted, lasted two or three weeks. Uh, this revival was into the third week, and um, I had to go and had to be there every night. And in my mind, I was uh, going to have a military future and... I absolutely, truthfully can sit here and tell you that going into the ministry was the last thing <laughs> on my mind. I was sitting on the back seat uh, with my mechanical drawing board working out quadratic equations in my algebra class and uh, finished and put all of my books in my briefcase listening to this preacher get done with his sermon so I could go home. And I stood up and I started listening to him for just a short moment about the will of God for your life. I couldn't tell you anything else he said in his sermon, but uh, I just thought, well, I'll pray this prayer. So I went down and prayed this prayer. Lord, you know it is my desire to go to West Point Military Academy. If you have other intentions for me, uh, you need to take that desire away from me. I walked home, and between the church and my home, I knew that I would never go to West Point. Uh, I wasn't excited about the ministry at all, 
uh, but in the core of my being felt like that that was the destiny God had for me. In, in March of 1958, uh, I preached my first sermon at my father's church at the First Assembly of God in Houston, Texas. Uh, and it went very well. Uh, the church was packed because from people who were curious and from people it. who couldn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> Some were there to have a testimony and others were there to testify. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the story is just getting good. You don't want to go away. We'll be right back on The Difference. Sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of the day-to-day -day that we forget to do the simple things in life, such as exchanging a friendly greeting with our neighbors. This month, with a special gift of any amount, we'll send you a special Not By Bread Alone salt box. For your generous gift of $250 or more, we'll also send you a signed copy of Diana Hagee's commemorative cookbook, Not By Bread Alone, accompanied by an apron, cookbook stand, dish towel, and salt box. Call the number on the screen or go to jhm.org slash bread. Welcome back to The Difference. My guest today are Pastor John and Diana Hagee, and we're talking about 65 years of full-time ministry. There was a lady sitting in that church that was the wife of one of the, lead, one of the uh, national leaders in the Assemblies of God movement. She told my mother she left, said, you know, he preaches like he's been preaching 40 years. She called a pastor in Dallas. His name was Lonnie Mullins and encouraged him to have me come to his church. So he called me and asked me if I'd come speak for the young people, which was a safe bet for him. Yeah. So <laughs> if you were bad, no problem. If you were good, he could use you again. That's exactly right. I presented my message to the young people. As we left, uh, he took me aside and said, I would like for you to preach that tonight at the, at the church. And I said, well, these people have just heard that. I'm sure it'd be a boring experience for them. He said, the substance of what you had to say was more than they can absorb in one session. I would like for you to do this. I said, okay. And I went to the pulpit and preached and brother heaven came down. And in typical Pentecostal fashion, when that service was over, he said, how many of you folks would like to start a revival with Brother John tomorrow night? Raise your hands. And like Pavlov's dogs, they all raised their hands. And he said, the revival is on. And I, I went to him. I said, I said, look, I, I haven't been saved but about four months yeah, here. I've just preached my one and only message. Yeah. <laughs> I phoned mother. I said, Lord, I'm in trouble. She said, well, how'd you get in trouble up there? And I said, no, that's not she the kind of trouble. She was familiar with you being in trouble, but not yeah, this kind. Exactly. <laughs> so so uh, I said, Mom, here's, what, here's, here's my situation. And I told her. She said, well, nothing good happens after midnight. And it was at midnight because I had to drive home from Dallas. And she said, get up in the morning, go to the prayer room and ask God to give you a thought. And then call me and tell me what you think it is. Now, and she was not only a gifted communicator, but she was also an educator in Bible school herself. She, she had taught homiletics and hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and understood very clearly what the scriptural objective was in, in preparing and teaching a sermon. We can say this on national television now that mom and dad are in heaven, that my mother could preach circles around my dad. She was <laughs> a gifted speaker. She had a... a comprehensive knowledge of scripture and expositorially it, she was a fountain of truth and uh, so I did exactly that and there were times when I was preaching that I was almost listening to me because what was coming out of me was not from me I mean God was just helping me Amen. beyond measure in 1960 I went uh, into evangelism for two years. 1960, I enrolled in Trinity University because I knew the church world like the back of my hand, but I knew nothing about the secular world. And I received a lot of criticism for going into the university because there were people who said, you have a divine gift to preach. You don't need to get it corrupted by more knowledge. 
And uh, <laughs> that was the Pentecostal point of view. And I went to uh, North Texas State, uh, it was called Teachers College in North Texas State University, Denton. but in Denton, Texas, that North Texas, I got my master's degree, I graduated, and I was invited to speak in Beaumont, Texas for a two-week revival. And when I was there, two couples from San Antonio came there. They said, Pastor, uh, uh, Brother Hagee said, we would like for you to consider coming to San Antonio to start a church. And um, I asked them these three questions. I said, do you have any people? They said, no. Do you have a building? They said, no. I said, do you have any money? They said, no. I said, this really looks like a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> of course, I was laughing. <laughs> And yeah. I had no more intention of coming here than I had of doing a backflip off of Niagara Falls. And the more I thought about it and prayed about it, the more that I was convinced that what seemed to have absolutely no potential may be exactly what God wanted me to do. And I came to San Antonio in September of 1966 to start what became known in the process of time as Cornerstone Church. The Bible tells us the hearts of a king are turned like streams in the desert. Your heart was turned instantly, mm -hmm. not by your desire, not by what you felt was in your best interest, but by God honoring the prayers of a mother who realized that you desperately needed a relationship with him. Mm, it's true. She, she didn't want you to be a pastor. She just wanted you to know Jesus. That's right. Wanted me to be a Christian. Yeah, she That's just right. said, if you leave here without Christ, she yeah. didn't say, when you leave here, you're going to do... She had none of that scripted out. She was just asking God for one thing, your salvation. And from there, God began to order your steps in a path that has brought you to this point today. Right. I want you to know that the same God who ordered the steps of the righteous in my father's life is the same God who has a plan for yours. I want you to hear more of this exciting testimony when we return on The Difference. I'm so grateful that I chose differently. I'm so happy that I chose you. I get to see you become the person God intended you to be. Thank you, Hagee Ministry Legacy Partners. There has never been a better time to share the love of Christ with a mother and a child than right now. When you partner with Hagee Ministries, your legacy impacts lives and transforms a nation. Call today or go to jhm.org slash partner. Welcome back to The Difference. I've had the privilege of hearing the story of God's faithfulness and Pastor Hagee's 65 years of full-time ministry. Dad, when we were last discussing the progression of the churches that you have been able to build by God's grace here in San Antonio, one thing happened in the congregation at Castle Hills that really changed the entire trajectory of your ministry. And that was you had a deep desire to begin to broadcast on television. Right. And that's where GETV, Global Evangelism Television, started. Now, today, global evangelism is a reality. Yes, it is. Today, we're on worldwide television. We're streaming over the Internet and, and have the opportunity to engage not only the nation, but the nations of the world each and every Sunday. But when you named Global Evangelism Television as an organization, where were you broadcasting to and how global was it? Uh, it wouldn't cross the street. We didn't, <laughs> we weren't even on the radio. But and, we were global. <laughs> but I said, we are going to fulfill the Great Commission. The Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I said, the only way we can do that is through global television. And we are going to have something called global evangelism uh, television and what was the response of the congregation? Shock. Uh, what was the response of your spouse? Amazement. <laughs> uh, we were told I was I was we had uh, 
when, when, when you say mom was amazed that you were going to be on television, her first response was, you don't need to do this. I was amazed and dismayed. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, you know, when you live with a visionary, um, it's a, it's, it's, it's a great ride, right? Yeah, it's it it never ride. boring. No, and he is the visionary, and I'm the person behind the scenes with a with a yellow pad, a pencil, and a big eraser because yeah. I'm the planner. So I look at things, and I saw how hard he was working. Uh, I saw again the budget, right? Because he's doing he's, five services. He's doing five services, and and he is a very hands-on pastor. Always has been. And um, we built, you know, the first 12 years of our marriage was concentration on our congregation, seeking to find leadership and expanding. And so whenever he added this to the mix, I thought that's just, it, yeah. it didn't fit. And not only that, I'll be very candid, uh, what I saw on national television, Christian television, I couldn't put myself in, I couldn't see myself in that picture. So again, what people see on the outside, I am 100%, 150% behind this man. That does yeah. not mean that behind closed doors, we're not saying, are, are you kidding me? How in yeah. the world are you gonna do this? Well, and, and, and dad, true to form, went in the direction that he felt he should go yes. and started to gather the paperwork to a, to, to acquire a license we because the apply. federal, you know, nowadays a cell phone gives every guy, every guy with a, a, a mouth the ability to have a network. That's right. But back then you actually had to apply for a license to broadcast and you were trying to acquire that license. What did they tell you about the process of getting that license? You know, they gave me all the legal paperwork. Which was a stack. And, which was an inch and a half thick. And as I was reading through it, I uh, came across a section about minority ownership. And when I read through that, their requirements were about one half what it would be for me. So I told her, you are going to get this license. I'm going to make this, I'm going to make Because this listed out. amongst the minorities were A females woman? yeah, uh, and, and Hispanics. Yes. Oh, and I mean, I checked two boxes, right? There is the a right. ram in the thicket. I mean, here we are on top of Mariah and she's tied by the horns. I remember him <laughs> coming into the kitchen and he, Diana, listen to this. And he told me and I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, absolutely not. I said, I am signing this paperwork because I'm submitting to my husband, but I want to let you know, I just don't see it. <laughs> And I, I tell especially the church uh, women that I teach that, you know, God has such a sense of humor. There is this man, this visionary, who's praying in, in one room, Lord, make this happen. Put us on television. Put us on television. And he said, Diana, I can preach to more people in one telecast than I could for years of filling our sanctuary. And I still couldn't catch the vision. And I'm in the other room praying, Lord, don't let it happen. Lord, close the doors. Lord, I just don't see how he can preach one more thing or do one more thing. He's, you know, 14, 15, 16, 18 hour days. I just don't see it. And of course, we're raising a family at the same time. And I'll never forget, I'll cut to the chase because this was a long process. But uh, it was Christmas, and Christmas is a very important time in our home, and the house was decorated, and Daddy was working late uh, at the office, which was often, and um, a knock came at the door, and I was in the kitchen cooking dinner, which I did often and still do, and I went to it, and it was a special delivery, and I accepted it, and it was to Diana Hagee. Actually, it was to Diana Castro Hagee, and I thought, okay, and I opened it, and there were the two approved licenses for the broadcast. Hallelujah. So, but he didn't know that yet. <laughs> he did not know that yet. So, and again, the women that are listening to this Christmas miracle again. That's right. <laughs> the women that are listening to this ministry probably can relate to this. Um, I went, I was alone in, in the living room. I put both of the, because they were in two separate envelopes. I put them on the Christmas tree. And then I sat before the Lord and I said, I'm, I ask you to forgive me because I have prayed. I have done everything I can 
asking you to stop this from happening. And you made it happen. Yeah. So I said, I put take off my hat of opposition and I put on my hat of commission. It was a Gethsemane moment because it's, it, if we can do this another way, mm -hmm. take this cup. That's right. And, and heaven said, no, this is the only way. Yeah. And you said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's such a powerful uh, testimony of several things. One, God's process of pulling all of the things together before they're necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, he, he put all of the pieces that needed to be present so that you could take the message of the gospel to the nations successfully before you ever had the desire to do it. And then once that desire was present, he had all of the puzzle pieces there. They just needed to know that was mm -hmm. the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you got the, the licenses for, you know, I remember very clearly, you've just got to see TV 20 and 33, do wah. That was the jingle <laughs> for the two channels that we had here in San Antonio, channel 20 and channel 33. When you got those two licenses, what are you going to do now? Okay, so I had first told our uh, church board I, the vision I had for that, and they said, uh, no, absolutely not. I said, we've just gotten into this third church. Our expenses for paying for this new church are, we're meeting that well, but we don't have enough money for television because that's a big dollar item. And then one of them said, if you want to do it yourself, you can. Well, I was writing books at this time and I did have an income, but wasn't sufficient for that. But we had a small farm south of town. I loved that farm. Yes, I did too. <laughs> I did too. It's 128 acres of heaven on earth. And I sold that. We agreed, Don and I agreed to sell that to start buying uh, television equipment, a small studio. Real uh, small. Uh, on our on our property. Have you been back by to see that thing? Yeah, it looks like a shed. <laughs> <laughs> this was, a lot of good this came was out about of that it. Shed. It's about uh, twelve by eighteen, very small. Upstairs was all of the equipment, and but I want to say on equipment. Here's a woman who was opposing it. And then I took the women of the church and I said, ladies, we're going to show support. So we raised $25,000 in 1978. 78. I remember and, it well. It was a good year. <laughs> yes, it was. Matthew was born in 78. And we uh, bought a camera. We called it Valiant One. Correct. And I think we still have it. But uh, that was a huge sacrifice. It's now in the museum of our ministry. It is. But we it had, is. Here's, here's the point we must make. We had gone through all of this, but yet we did not have the way to connect what right. we had with the Rest cable of, network, with the television mm -hmm. that would reach this city. And as we were putting this together unto our beyond our knowing, our city leadership said, we are going to have a citywide cable system. And they... One vendor. And they invited seven major cable companies to come to San Antonio. And they said, we're going to give it to one cable company. And the president of that one cable company that won it was in a store owned by one of our church members. And our church member told him that I was trying to get on TV. But at that point in time, Henry Cisneros was our mayor. mayor and I knew uh, Mayor Cisneros. And we went down and I had a chat with him and our friends on the city council. And I felt confident that his bid would be accepted. It was accepted. Now we hooked up and we had... 24 hours a day, seven days a week, television exposure to this city. And I, I'm not one to complain. I said, Lord, global evangelism <laughs> is our target. We are reaching our city. How can we reach the world? In a week, Paul Crouch called me and he said, I see that you have access 
to this new cable company in San Antonio, which is one of the largest in the nation at that point in time. He said, I would like to be on that. I said, I'd like to have you on that. Because we had no programming. Yeah, we had no programming. <laughs> we, we've now got a new problem, 24 hours of content. <laughs> it was a win-win. Right. Trust me, from uh, uh, somebody who preaches 30 minutes at a time, 24 hours is a is long, a long day. <laughs> so what I, what I started out doing is every preacher in San Antonio who was a gospel preacher, I said, I will give you 30 minutes a day and you can do these things. You can preach 30 minutes from a Bible text, preach or teach. Do not raise money because I'm not charging you, and but preach the gospel to this city. Mm -hmm. And it was at this point that Paul Crouch called me. We traded time. I said, I want to be on, on uh, National uh, television. TBN on Sunday morning well, in, a, in a good time, and uh, you can do your flagship on this cable system uh, seven days a week, 24 seven. He said, we're on. And from that day until 1992, this is 1978 somewhere. That day until 1992, we were on Trinity Broadcast Network free. We were trading time. Mm -hmm. And when Paul went national, put a satellite up, we fulfilled the commission. We were now global television ministry for a fact. What we had put in the ground in faith produced exactly what we asked for. It took several years for it to happen, but God requires time sometimes to do major things because he has to work through people. Amen. And oh, God and, came through for us. And, you know, the, the old... Testament verse, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time mm -hmm. and, and harvest. harvest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of the most agonizing moments of your life are going to be between the time you plant it That's right. and you pick it. That's right. Because it'll never grow as fast as you want it to, but when it gets grown up, it's going to be really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, your mother in many ways was the, the hand that, that fashioned uh, and you've described her many times as the chisel in God's hand that mm -hmm. shaped your life. That's right. She had a statement that she would make about how to achieve success. What was that statement? If you really want to achieve something in life, find out what God wants done and do that. As simple as that sounds, that works. Today, you heard Pastor Hagee share how God used his mother to continually ask for his hand upon her son's life, to continually knock on a door where great resistance was met, but God made a way where there seemed to be no way. I know many of you are watching and you've got similar situations in your life. I want you to know the same God who heard my grandmother's prayers is listening to your prayers and he can make a way in your life today. Thank you for watching The Difference, and I pray that you'll be back as we continue this conversation with Pastor Hagee.